that's just supporting the Dorado software development software and an idea with the upper water column measurements from the Goldberg Dorado vehicle. And in Amari, we've been uh, running um, campaigns that produce um, millions of measurements over a two week or month long period from dozens of platforms that are deployed in the ocean for the purposes of measuring um, biological processes and, and, and support the biological uh, chemical oceanography science here um, at Ambari. So, so over the past several years, I've been working on a database system to handle all this data. That's the database is called Stokes, the Spatial Temporal Oceanographic Query System. And it, uh, it, it's built on uh, all open source uh, software. The core is a, is a Postgres database. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a web front end to it, which I'm navigating through now. This is all built using uh, modern web technology, AJAX driven um, jQuery interaction. And what I wanted to to demonstrate here um, to this group is, is the future where I see this going, the capability to provide the looking at the full context of data into three dimensions. And this was a, a campaign that that we did in Southern California last uh, fall. And this is actually highlighted in a, in a blog post on the X3 DOM web page. So I'll just demonstrate a little bit what that looks like. So there's um, two point three million measurements here of, of data from from these platforms. If I select the Dorado uh, platform, then it show it is shown the map and in the time time depth series of the data, um, it is an overview of that that data, and then. Since it's a fasted search, everything updates when it's like I'm on an external server, so it seems to be slow here in responding. I was hoping it's going to be a little faster. But we could see what parameters have been measured. I'm going to on the Wi Fi here. Well, it's, it should be faster. I think I'm going to. For you, uh, you have. Um, I'm currently at VPN. Yeah, let's go to our Let's go, I'm going to go to a, uh, a smaller um, database. This was done last, <coughs> last August here in Monterey Bay. And if we select the lotto, much faster. We can zoom in in, in, in time and depth. We can plot, um, say, an optical optical backscatter here in, in this in this section plot, and then zoom in to, to areas of interest. And this is the data is 3D here, so this is these are the yo-yo patterns of the AED measuring optical backscatter on the water column. And in the spatial view, we can, we can show that on the map. And if we just click that button here, it's going to plot every every single point that it can. Uh, it's giving every thirty first point, but it's it's a projection into the horizontal of all this data. But click in three D and, and zoom in on this area of the North Bay, and, <coughs> and we can make this full screen. We can see the data in the context of the topography, and here we have full control over, over the display. I've exaggerated the vertical by factor 10 to figure out the water column process. And then you can zoom in and, and see that these, where these uh, backscatter visuals are. We usually see these in the head of Silicon Canyon when you're seeing mixing of the, of the surface settlements. That there's always a this high set of that's there. So, the technology behind the 3D world here is using WebGL, but there's a there's a language on top of the WebGL which is a declarative 3D 
parameters called X3 DOM. Uh, actually, X3 DOM implements an ISO standard called X3D, which is something you're familiar with verbal. It's, it's, it's next generation verbal. And what these nodes here are, are fully cognizant of geospatial coordinates. So these data are referenced to the WPSA coordinates. So I'm working with the group through the Open Geospatial Consortium and the web tree and sort of standardize how we represent geospatial data in this whole three dimensional world where we have the richness of a, a full gaming type environment to build any kind of 3D object in your life. We can animate camera positions. Animations, we can break imagery sort of train. And the, uh, the, the people who are making X3 DOM, search for X3 DOM, is, is from Fraunhofer, Germany. And there's some really, really bright people that are building this toolkit. It's pure JavaScript, open source, close to to get up. And they've got some pretty cool examples. Do uh, search for X3 down binary geometry. <coughs> Wait, uh, let's see if I can find a good example here. Yeah, these are some of their pages. Here. I'm doing a, a search here on uh, Dave's computer for that. Not my computer, I have this all. They have a, they're experimenting with different ways to, uh, to represent really high uh, polygon count geometric data, make them efficient in delivering from the web server straight into the GPU of the web server. So they're using HX array buffers to read the binary data straight on the site, and then they've got a progressive the optimized polygon delivery mechanism to let you uh, bring a very, very dense geometric data that you can replicate with the shape. And in this, I think, it worked really well for a lot of the point cloud type data that we've been collecting to deal with overhangs and, and to go beyond elevation grids. But I showed in my example. Stokes is, is an elevation grid extracted using an empty grid from our, from our data archive. We used a, a macro to convert it to a geothermal uh, empty system macro. Brought that into the Stokes system. But the future for being able to merge our water column measurements with high resolution imagery uh, it has some, some, some fruits going down this path. Graphics library, the front offer does not do binary geometry. Where are the, the calculations? Where are the GL calculations located? In the browser. So this is using OpenGLES, which is the which is now compiled into modern web browser Firefox. Safari and Chrome yeah. have it, Windows are IE 11 will have it. So, for a developer, for me, when I add a terrain model to the Stokes database, it, I use the word declarative in the way, in a programming sense, not, not imperative. So it's like, it's like when I get a job code, I tell, I, I just, Put in scene graph elements inside my, inside my web page, my HTML page, which is like HTML elements. HTML elements. I just say angle bracket elevation. So, so for a, a person who's putting content together, it's, it's pretty simple. The, the actual programming, I don't do any programming. I'm not making any OpenGL files. That's, that's the imperative style. That's all done in the, in the JavaScript. I just know the JavaScript. Somebody did it. Somebody did it. <laughs> right. but, but it's like you, you want to get data from an SQL database, you write a query, and you have 
no idea what optimization is. I'm saying somebody did that. And they, you, you tell them what you want to have done, and if that's, that's the way they execute. I don't know how many people have worked with instruments that have built-in web browsers. If you have a new rival laser scanner, it has your built-in web servers inside of it. So you can walk up and talk to it by just clicking buttons on its little thing. Or you can log into it with your iPhone. Or like in the case of you have a boat, put it up on the top of the boat, and you can log into it with Wi-Fi over our, just a laptop. So it's and it's pretty amazing. To be able to have that kind of platform independence and communication. And not prior to seeing that thing actually, <coughs> I would have said, like the web browser interface, it's something like an assistant, for example, you just email, click email, and take our screen. But now that I've seen how it works like that, it's pretty cool. I mean, the <coughs> idea that maybe, maybe the future interface of MD7 is a web. Yeah, so everything's open. I, I don't know how much you're interested in it, but you can source on that web page and see what the. But it's just, they're just HTML tags that specify the scene. Can you imagine like, setting up an MD system processing box down in the lab and be able to broadcast that up to the bridge so they can see the data coming in? Chief scientist office. All that stuff. Very cool. You think about what you create. Right. So, you know, it, it, even with a team of people, the Fraunhofer engineers are the people are just doing multi resolution, you know, multi, you know, multi tile high resolution train visualization. There's real challenges of that. How to do that, find certain ones. Um, and it, it, there's really some standards involved. What we'd like to do is have it be very much like web maps. So you can issue a web map service that understands the bounding box of the property resolution data property based on the plot tree path set. And that's what that, that, that progressively optimized polygon delivery is. <coughs> and tying that into the geospatial context, there's a bit of a challenge. So that, you know, when I zoom in to Silicon Canyon, I would like to see the highest resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm going to use Chrome from now on. That's right after the job. It was good. Show uh, kind of what we've been doing at UFTS and why some of the questions I've been asking have come from. And just to, in general, unlike a you know a pure academic institution, <laughs> USGS is usually doing work for a customer or a client, and that's usually a, the state or uh, national needs. We work directly for Congress to solve <laughs> big problems. So uh, some of the things that I really would like to see. Our immediate needs are big, big time support for shallow water. And that, what that means for me is we're always dealing in high resolution data sets, so lots and lots of samples per meter, uh, very large data volumes. When you're in three meters of water, you can ping 20 times a second. So 
that means whatever technology you're using is producing 10, 20 times as much data as that same sonar in deep water. And we have to somehow filter this stuff and clean up the mess that we've just made. Uh, a primary issue, we, we no longer use tides at all. Uh, we are monitoring a water level. It's an independent project that will be tied back into uh, the survey group. And that's partly a result of trying to cross, if you look behind you, and you try to cross over the surf zone, all of the beach has been surveyed by terrestrial LIDAR, either airborne or mobile systems. And then we go out in boats, and, and we can do the deep water. Um, occasionally, uh, some parts of the coast can be surveyed with bathymetric LIDAR. But to get all of that stuff, uh, and we will use jet skis to go right across the surf zone. And to get all that stuff, uh, into the same vertical and horizontal data is, is a big challenge and it's something we can work constantly. So in order to, to maximize the amount of coverage that we're getting, uh, the preferred technology is always airborne, so you can get a much bigger swap. So if you can go airborne, that's the way to go. Uh, if we can't or we're moving offshore, that stuff uh, then you start looking at multiple heads. Or in our case, we've gone with interferometers. We had dual 7111s, you know, like configured like you were talking about, pointing off to the side or tilted and slanted so that we can shoot up the side of canals and creeks and stuff. And of course, uh, various variations on LIDAR. A lot of this stuff is motivated by these societal needs. This is uh, Sumatra, where <coughs> All of, this is right after the tsunami from that earthquake, and I just have a couple of pictures that show the kind of work we get involved in. Our scientists were out there trying to assess damage, provide guidance to the military, or to send help to understand how what would happen to us if the same thing, that same wave, would come to us. We have power plants uh, right on the beach, and we have infrastructure that we can destroy if a big wave. This is Katrina. So you're deeply involved in some of that work. And here's the North Slope. A lot of places in Alaska which were permafrost 20 years ago when they were drilling oil cap or oil wells are now actually eroding out. And if you look, you can see a so capped oil well right there. So you could probably by now this this photo is about three years old. So the shoreline has been retreating in places like Barrow at almost uh, 50 meters a year. All of these capital oil wells are now submerged. So you can see the kind of environmental issues that uh, we tend to deal with. And a lot of it is right at the shoreline where there's an intersection between people, infrastructure, and land. So uh, this is another photo from uh, the Elwa River, which is a uh, northern part of Washington State, and they've just removed two dams there, which is the largest dam removal in the world. And they're trying to basically free flow the Elba River, which goes up into the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, and the uh, environmental challenges of that, when you take a 100-year-old dam, and all of the sediment that's been dammed up behind is now rushing out and going into power plants. <coughs> They actually had had to stop lowering the dam because so much sediment was getting into the power plant down below that it was clogging up their turbines. So, um, we use terrestrial LiDAR systems. This is probably seeing these. They look like a little R2D2. The, the LiDAR spins around and scans everything within range, usually up to a kilometer away. We use you know, old school to run around the LiDAR array data. GPS system on the backpack. We have jets or uh, ATVs that you can go up and down the beach. Uh, again, with a, a uh, you know, RTK, it's an RTK uh, GPS system mounted on the back. And then we just measure how far the wheels were below, drive back <coughs> We have, this is our newer toy, this is a same kind of laser system that now has an IMU. Uh, this is a Coda Octopus F-180 inside, as you can see the two antennas. We can put a positive V in there as well. 
and then you can put this that whole thing mounted to Yakima racks, so we can put it on any any mobile system that has Yakima racks. Boat, we have it on ATVs, we have trailers that the thing can walk on. You can put it on top of your car and just drive it around. So that whole package is about 70 pounds. You can ship it anywhere in the world. It's been to Kwajalein, uh, <laughs> you send it up to Alaska, and then we drive it up and down wherever we need to have put the traffic down. And it runs in this mode. You need to stop it and have it spin, and it will collect a static set that is kind of circular. Or you can just fix it in one direction and drive along uh, just like you would with the multi. And the data, in fact, the data we use to acquire a memory mobile mode is a PDS 2000. So they have written an interface to provide a system, and it looks exactly like the mobile. Uh, jet skis using the same technology. This is uh, our West Coast survey boat. I just, you know, it's got all the same systems you have on a big boat, except it's all compressed down uh, to a small system. Um, one of our issues is almost all these small boats have full mounted transducers. We have crutches down at the bottom. These are big, heavy things. But basically, every time you put a boat on a new, or put that summer system on a new platform, you're back to recapturing and recalibrating. So we can do that on every single survey. But always, um, because of this integration issue, we're always tied and tethered to some ground-based network system. Usually, uh, lately, there's national systems that are in place, or statewide systems where you can tie in. Uh, and they'll have four stations up and down the coast. Um, and we can actually use cell phone connections or post processing with the Atlantic has a cause pack software. I don't know how many people use that. But it allows you to uh, basically, in post processing, you can create a network around your survey and get sub, sub, it's sub decimeters, usually on the order of one to two centimeter accuracy of the antennas, um, up, to, up to about 70 miles away from your station. And they have post processing, or they have a PPP processing, you can go up to 500 miles away from your station with less vertical accuracy. So basically, it makes tides unnecessary. Um, and of course, when you're in shallow water, it's crucial that you have accurate measurement of tides. You know, you're right up where the tide really matters. I was kind of surprised that in the deep ocean, I guess I never thought about it, but uh, AUV is a good one too. And you've only got a pressure sensor. So we have uh, we stopped using draft uh, Squat tables, we don't use them anymore because the speed of the boat doesn't matter as long as you measure your RTK system accurately. And uh, we're not using tides anymore. And then uh, document wire. We even use GPS to get our tides. So we've got one guy uh, who mounted this thing on a tide station. Here, went up and down. Uh, we still have biologists, and they care what the water is. <coughs> But we tried to eliminate water level as a, as a measurement on our system. Basically, the idea is you've got a satellite in space, and you've got your boat, and your vessel, and your sonar system, and then you've got the seafloor. Try to eliminate uh, the water surface as a measurement. <laughs> and that ultimate goal is to make things like this. This is the uh, Skokomish, or Nooksack Delta, Nooksack Delta in uh, Puget Sound. And it's a combination of, um, this is all, all the stuff in red is bathymetric or terrestrial LIDAR. There's some bathymetric LIDAR here. Everything here is interferometric LIDAR. Actually, all the rest of it is interferometry. And all of it was put together um, in the same vertical data and the same horizontal data, and down to about six centimeters offsets between all of it. But everything above here is subtitled. So the water goes in and out from about here up to here. So our boat is actually over land at low tide. So if we, we come in at high tide, we survey that with the, the interferometer, and then at low tide, water's all gone, and then you can come back with the terrestrial lighter system. But this, um, here's another example we just did a couple of weeks ago. So if your goal is to try, like this is a, uh, this area here was surveyed last in the 60s with single beam data from NOAA. 
And then there was some uh, terrestrial LiDAR shots as well. We go back in and try to get this, this edge here, and it's prorated because of various changes to the river system over 100 meters in the 50 years since the last survey. And the working, that's these kind of difference maps are what our scientists are after. And there's policy implications for that. Where is the salmon going to live? And how much sediment is coming out as a result of modifications up, upstream? Uh, another example here I just wanted to show. These are, this is all bathymetry, and these contours are in NAP88. So basically, from here up, uh, you would be grounded you know, at low tide. So sometimes we have uh, 30 or 40 centimeters underneath the head. But uh, as far as any system goes, where I run into problems is to do this kind of work. Here's the track line that we did for that, to that last survey. It's probably 200 track lines from one end to the other. So just managing which track line is just clicking on it and saying which is the track line that is messed up or has the wrong you know, key pitch roll becomes an issue. If I try to make, if I use an MBM plot and I put all the you know, track line names on a survey like this, it's just an illegible mess. So some kind of survey management uh, would be useful to me a lot. It's hard to keep track of, of each, each thing. And, and of course, just the advantage of any system is that if I put all this stuff in Paris, it really starts to bog down. There's just so much data in that little area that it has trouble. All the 3D rendering and spinning around and flying through works great when you've got a patch test. But if you put a billion soundings into a small area, it's terrible. We are really into the differences uh, between all our various systems. A small tear in shallow water where you're plotting at half meter or, or smaller resolution shows up. So if your vertical offset is, say, 10 or 15 centimeters, and you try to put a thousand-metric LIDAR and a sonar data set together, you'll have a 10-centimeter wall all down that data set. And 10 centimeters doesn't sound like much, but it makes everything look coral, and none of the, none of the shoreline will all of our beach erosion stuff will work. Delf 3D won't work. You're at a big wall. So in this case, we were comparing uh, the jet ski data to the SWAP Plus. This is our interferometer <coughs> along uh, from basically just comparing the difference in mean differences. And we got it down to about a centimeter difference between the two. There's, there's noise around there. Here's the distribution. I'm really interested in trying to get a handle on small, <coughs> subtle errors. Um, here is a example where it just plotted overlapping two. This is a backpack went through here. I'm sorry, I didn't have one of these for the sonar. And then we came back through with that LiDAR system and plotted it down right over the top. We're trying to get our elevation differences. There's lots of problems with the steep. There's a guy carrying a backpack and trying to climb up, you know, a sandy bank or whatever. But again, um, trying to get these errors out. Here's the Columbia River Bar. Um, one of the problems when you're working with GPS data as you're tied is you have to deal with the geoid. So what the geoid is, when you have, is everyone familiar with the whole orthometric and ellipsoidal hike stuff? So just quickly, when you say mean sea level or something like that, you can, that is an orthometric sea level based view of the world. If you're using GPS or some satellite based system, you have a mathematical ellipse that's kind of the best fit to your location of the world. The difference between those two, this mathematical ellipse and that orthometric height is the geoid. And in the United States, uh, this is uh, northern Washington, Columbia River. The difference in those over space is huge. So here it's we're 23.73 meters below the ellipsoid on this end of the survey. And then 15 kilometers away, it's negative 24.58. So that is a tilt between mean sea level of over a meter. Um, 
So if you did something like pick a tide station right here, this is Astoria, Oregon, and apply the correction to that whole area, you would be wrong over here by over here. And all of your all of your uh, hydrographic modeling would have to tilt it. And you can't flood the river properly. Uh, here's another, this is just another example where we combined uh, uh, airborne LIDAR with, uh, this is a lake, it's the only reservoir for the city of San Francisco. Here's a little the dam where the dam is. What, this is also the trace of the San Andreas Fault. See the San Andreas Fault going through here? Before this was put in, so the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct comes down and dumps right into this. What they were worried, what we got called in time, is where exactly is that trace? Because there's addits, all of the, the fresh water that goes into the Bay Area comes right out of these two lakes. What they were worried about is if there was an earthquake and the, the San Andreas sheared those addits, there would be no fresh water to 11 million people for months. So this is like a multi-billion dollar question. Was the San Andreas fault here, or where they kind of ignore it? Was it over here where it was going to cause them to redesign this whole system? Um, but here again, we want to have these huge differences between, in, in this particular project, there were a bunch of agencies involved. There was uh, academics who flown the LIDAR, the, the LIDAR that's available for most of the West Coast up and down the San Andreas Fault. And that was all geo referenced with uh, technology from Berkeley. And I'm mean, great LIDAR people. But then they handed the data off to yeah, the uh, San Francisco Public Utilities District, who has high resolution ortho photos. And they had like sub meter pixels on their air photography. And they were looking specifically for where manhole covers were and where all these different pieces of infrastructure were at. And they used a USGS 10 meter DEM to ortho rectify that photo. And when they laid it down on the LIDAR, nothing agreed. And this wound up introducing probably fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of arguments over <laughs> where things belonged and how we were going to all make it go together. And a lot of it came down to just not fully understanding what WGS84 is, what NAV NAVD88 is, what all these acronyms are that we just throw around. Stuff you can mostly ignore if you're offshore. But here at the shoreline, this stuff really makes it so for me, um, what I'd like to see in the system is be very, very clear about where the common reference point is on the vessels, where all the offsets are measured, where was their position antenna placed, where was the transducer, what's the orientation as you're moving through. It's still a little ambiguous to me exactly how that all works. I'm, sh I'm sure it's partly just me not fully understanding. There's also the issue of if we go out and we collect an initial data set with one set of uh, position and we come back and we post process it and I feed it back in, I'd like to be able to keep both. The one we originally, channel one, you know, would be the original data set we put in, and then we post process and come back in with, with actual trajectories that were run through models and cleaned out forward and reverse process in the GPS. Um, and I think that's similar to kind of your question about preserving uh, what's happened to which channel of, of navigation are we using. So currently, I think the way that's handled now in the system is at the, the I.O. level. But there's not a formal switch that you can say, let's go from channel one to channel two. Maybe. Well, what, what can happen is if you have navigation records that aren't survey records, what the processing does is modify the navigation that's associated with the survey. As long as we have, if it happens that we have original navigation or anything else in that data stream, not directly associated with the thing, so that we survey stuff, that would be preserved. So you can. There's one tool that you can get at this other channel. That's the right term. It goes to this other day, and that's MD Gambit, which enables one to extract particular data record types extract from those. So that's, that's a path. 
path to so extract the navigation of the attitude from asynchronous records and then merge it back in the new process. So I guess to, just to summarize the USGS, the reason I'm interested in these systems is a lot of different models. I'm hoping that we'll someday go to all of the main ones that we need, R and that kind of stuff. And they're I can help get some of that going, so I'm not. I'm, I'm encouraged by this because the alternative is the ad hoc stuff that we are already doing. We can't deal with elevation data in the GIS. No GIS on the market right now, actually. In the market. And that's partly because they don't understand. There's a lot of misconceptions about exactly what a, a geodetic data is, a three-dimensional data, and how that works. The, you spend a lot of money from Trimble to get software that does this. Talk to NGDs for uh, National Geodetic Survey, but some open source stuff, and Fortran that does this kind of work, HTTP, and things like that. But these little subtle differences that you can kind of ignore if you're in a thousand meters of water, who cares? Uh, really show up at the shoreline if there's a one meter gap right at the shoreline edge. And so, uh, cool. I'm hoping that we keep all the different vertical measurements separate. I think I would like to see some kind of vessel file idea, my suggestion, where I'm not sure exactly how this would look. It's already a parameter file. That's per track line, the way I understand it. But it might be nice if we could actually say for a particular vessel, these are the offsets that I want you to use. This is how the system is configured. Um, the comments on that, the way I'm thinking about it now, um, there should be um, a vessel file equivalent, if you want to call it something else, but um, a, a platform file. I'm just that's throwing that's out yeah. a, a, a platform definition file that exists, <laughs> that more, one or more of those must exist in a processing environment, and the parameter file would point at which one is relevant to the given file. Because you may well be doing something like changing the role bias in yeah. work, right? So what have you. Um, and there needs to be an ability to define that at the pre-process stage and apply Corrections based on it at the pre process stage and an ability to change it as part of your process and then apply further changes in the process. And um, the details of what all goes into such a platform definition um, aren't clear to me. And clearly, I, I know some things that have to go in there. I'm reasonably confident that I don't conceive of everything that I can do. And so um, what I encourage is for everybody who has a notion of like that, please send me your notion so that I can make the first version that is that comprehensively integrates everything that everyone thinks of. Um, but that's that is um, a key step in me solving the problems that I alluded to that I have to do with the relatively high resolution data. Um, these things start to become more visible. But they're already a problem at, at any scale. So a lot of the headaches Christian deals with are, are precisely related to these same issues uh, more than any of them. So, um, yeah. I, so I just uh, to clean separation of datum from lever arm offsets. Datum is one of your lever arm offsets, not somehow integrated into that. That way we can switch from doing tide based work to GNSS work without having to GNSS. Uh, global navigation satellite system. So that way I don't GPS, GLONASS, uh, the new uh, European system. Uh, 
Yeah, so with GNSS is now you catch all for that stuff. GPS does, you know. It's just because it's bigger. Like my system uses um, all 12 GPS satellites we can see and then another 10 or so GLONASS satellites. But it's not huge. And uh, it's good, it's a good acronym, of course. It's close to GPS, which is kind of ridiculous. But, uh, so I'd like to see that separate. Make sure you keep things like heave and attitude, uh, or heave, tide, and all your vertical upper ones completely separate. Uh, in some file formats that we deal with, fine. There's a lot of mashing together of that stuff. It makes it difficult to tease out and switch sensors. So if you go for tides in the field, that's you want your operators to depth below the transducer. But in the office, you switch to an ellipsoid, and you've got everything annotated for 240 weird numbers, basically. Um, yeah, just it's easy to do that if we keep them separate. Okay. So just to follow on that, I, I would ask that anyone who has a concept of a platform definition that is more than the position and attitude offsets of your basic sensors to some reference point in the platform. If you're thinking of anything more complicated than that, I already know that, but anything more complicated than that, please send it to me. So, over the course of this, we talked about a lot of stuff. The uh, multi transducers we already covered. I'd like to see that one. You're starting to use them a lot. I have currently a dual headed system and I have a three headed system. So that means one one head, one mounting rack with three different transducers all coming at the same time. And right now, in these systems, it's kind of modeled around multi beam and one transducer. So, for example, offsets are different for each one of those three. There's only one place to put them in the current information. Um, LAS is more than that most people like our data. I think there's libraries out to do this, so I'm not expecting that. And it's, um, it's not see. Just know that the last community is now trying to switch <coughs> to a new format. Or to what? To a new format. Well, whatever. There's so much LAS data out there. But the author of LAS is leading the switch, too. So. So. I'm, uh, that was it. And if anybody's interested, uh, if I'm taking too much time, I've got some uh, interferometric data with the three transducer heads, which if you've never seen interferometer data, it's a whole new world for compared to multi. I can show you what that looks like. Yeah, <laughs> The resolution got <coughs> I uh, this might look better if you see on I can't see enough of the screen with the uh, resolution. So uh, interferometers are kind of halfway between a side scan and a multi. They use the basic idea is <coughs> it is configured very similar to a side scan system. We have a, a long array that broadcasts, and you have four receiver arrays <coughs> that the data all comes back to. And it basically works under triangulation because the, the four received staves are tilted or slanted. They have different spacing. When the sound comes back, it's going to arrive at each one of those four stays at slightly different time. So the assumption is that as the sound goes out over the seafloor, it's going to have amplitude peaks and uh, dips, just like you would expect in a side scan. And since those are going to be slightly out of alignment in time, because they arrived at the transducers at slightly different time, it took a little longer to get to the one that's furthest away. All you have to do to figure out is you know time for that sample and to figure out the angle, you just have to figure out if I line these up in time, I know the distance between these two staves, 
So there is a solution that says, if I can find this little mountain, this peak, in both data sets, and there's a slight time offset, you know that there's some angle that will make those rise at the same time. At that rate. So that, that's the problem, uh, is that it could be here, 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 here. So you have multiple stages that you try to correlate all of them together to get a better idea of what's happening. The way that tends to look, um, if I can find the actual number. <coughs> This is a, a classic two-stage interferometer. And I, well, you've got the transducers up here, and every sample, you know, uh, you know, see all these white dots. This is every single sample that came back with a correlation that said, I think that all four of these staves agree that this range and this angle has been colored with a white dot. So this is, um, here's the transducer head. Here's a whole bunch of samples that are probably the seed for it. And then here's a whole bunch of stuff that's garbage. And so the way the generation, at least this generation of interferometer has been working, that you, have, you run a series of 12 or 13 filters over the top of the seed board to try to pick out that return. And the advantage of this is here. Where in this case, um, you're in 5 meters of water, 6 meters of water, but you've got a 100 meters of water. So the downside, of course, is it's pretty noisy. Um, so let me uh, rewind that. They do tend to do actually a pretty good job of finding the C4. Like I was showing you some of the slides, we've done comparisons with uh, external mapping systems and stadia rod measurements, and we can do repeat surveys at sub decimeter levels. So, in the order of five to six centimeters is typical once you come to the line through the statistical noise. I would not use an interferometer for finding like a target or a piling or something. You never tell for sure whether there's some spike in your data, or is it just noise. But if you can accept that, say, a one meter resolution grid is actually pretty good, and then you get the advantage in shallow water, it's really wide swap. That can save a ton of time. I mean, a classic multi-game is maybe four to one, maybe five to one that you can use. So here you have half the swap width that you would have. So that's the trade-off you're making. Things. They're also mechanically much simpler because you've only got uh, the only part that's in the water are these four stays on the side. And all the processing is done up on the box. You don't have this huge array that you've got to protect, which can be a problem in shallow water when you actually worry about hitting stuff. We've bent uh, several of these things. We have breakaway mounts so that if we do run into something, it pops off. Um, and it saved us quite a bit. So the bathy. Here it looks like this. Um, and here's the you know, port starter side. There's some kind of huge artifact here going, or a roll problem on this sense. This isn't my data, but I just I got it from the manufacturer. And then here's the second big problem with the interferometer, because it's depending on angle measurement. If you're shooting down at Nader, you can't measure angles very accurately. You wind up with no data. In the nature, the same place your backscatter would be bad on the conventional on any system for the same reason. So there's always been this problem where you've got this nice fat swath that you couldn't see straight below you. So the way USGS has done is we typically step over about five or six meters and run another line, shoot back across and fill a hole. And then we've lost the advantage of having a really wide swath. So the latest uh, generation of these things. They're starting to market systems that have three transducers on them. You've got the two that are forward facing, or excuse me, sideways, and one that's forward facing. And I've got that's what this data is. 
So I'll turn on that other And now if the neighbor's gone. So it's now possible to get something that's much closer to a, a multi-beam record with, uh, you know, 10, 10, 15 to 1 swap rate. This could be really huge in areas where I'm working in really shallow water. So it's, it's kind of cool. And of course, these are conventional, they're really good side scans. They have beautiful back scans. And they're very easy to conceptually to deal with it. Like angular response, if you're into backscatter analysis, you're looking at the signature of uh, what is it that we're actually bouncing stuff off of. Backscatter is really easy to do. Yeah. 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 It's really hard to not be able to see the whole thing. Sorry. This is just two scales showing the side scan. We have two, well, we select which of the stage and then listen to it. I think it actually would be good. Um, and what we've been able to do with this is some pretty much the same kind of conventional, or the same kind of post processing you can do with a multi time series data. You can map each pixel of the backscatter down onto the seafloor uh, and do geometric corrections and radiometric corrections, uh, like you would with Geocoder or, or uh, some of the other schemes that are out there. But, yeah, guys up in Vancouver have got a system that works with That's kind of my problem. Anyway, wants to see, we've, we've got hundreds and hundreds of these surveys, so none of the pre-transducers. We're trying to decide whether or not we should invest in this kind of five using the three transducer system. <coughs> so any questions or that's all I got. Well I, I just comment that one of the architectural implications of trying to support this kind of data properly um, would be Carry the, the possibility of having multiple channels to start thinking about data channels. Again, not right now, it's the Bimetry Amplitude and Side Scanner on a given basis, and uh, it probably makes more sense to think about on a third, not necessarily thing, but per sample basis of having some arbitrary number of channels available, which may be of different types. Um, and in terms of the notion of having a platform definition file or, or such, then each channel would be associated with the sensor, which would have its own offset. So I think you know, in terms of the architecture that all of this has to get back to the end. It's going to work better. Any other comments or questions for David's lovely stuff? Just a comment for you from the next one. What a comment I got. I assume that's going to be as another photo copy of the Yeah, that's really good on the list. That would be an obvious channel. <laughs> Just yeah, well, stuff. Peter was assuming I was scared of video, and actually, I'm scared of water. <laughs> um, yeah. I think this is good, though. I've seen people talk about side scan. They just talk about sectors within, assuming that everything is pointing out straight up the sides. And in the last case, it breaks that model completely. I, I couldn't show enough windows, but there's more windows in this software that will actually show you the orientation of the really strong. Yeah. 
sideways look, forward look. And the way a forward looking is it's tilted. So it makes like an S pattern on the C4 coming to put. Uh, it'll be interesting working with that. But it, it does that with the energy look pretty darn good. It makes a it makes a case for certainly using one inner barometer for two seven yeah. Well, I, I guess I could comment also that we are experimenting with um, doing forward downloading multi views and um, creating these graphs for what it is. Some of you collecting data, you might find that easier. But, uh, so it's, and there are, and there will be more, uh, sonars come out that are two-dimensional, that don't use the line of sound is, um, but rather a two-dimensional area of sound is. That's, that's certainly like a, a class Just at noon. Um, um, so I think we, we might as well go ahead and, and uh, go to lunch. But I do want to continue having comments uh, from various groups as to what their thoughts are and what their needs are. And coming back to that. Um, so we can continue with that after lunch. Um, I know that Evan's going to be the free third. Is there anyone else that's going to be um, a time limit on their participation here? Okay. And well, I think we ought to be able to do the important stuff by the free third. Mm -hmm. All right, so as far as we're going to go on, let's see. Okay. Um,